want a girl just like the girl that married dear old dad. She was a pearl and the only girl that daddy ever had. A good old fashioned girl with heart so true. One who loves nobody else but you. I want a girl. Hi, I think that it's finally time to start diversifying the Chilling Profile series and moving into things outside of Junji Ito. I had always planned to do characters from horror games on this series, so today we are going to be discussing a character from one of my all-time favorite horror games, Outlast. Which, unless you're a day one subscriber that is somehow still around, you're probably unaware of how special this is. Because about 10 years ago when I started this channel as a gaming channel, a playthrough of Outlast was the first series I ever did. So starting to do some Outlast lore on the channel now after every change it's gone through is really bringing things full circle. Oh my god! What the sh**? The character in question today is the secondary antagonist of the Whistleblower DLC. The groom, the thing below, the man downstairs himself, Mr. Eddie Gluskin. If you've ever played Outlast Whistleblower, you'll remember Eddie as the psychopathic delusional serial killer that relentlessly pursues your character Waylon Park through the asylum with the intent of making Waylon into his perfect bride. Before we get into it though, for those of you who haven't played Outlast, I feel I need to set the scene a bit so it all makes a bit more sense. I do plan on doing a longer, more in-depth rundown of Outlast lore in another video, so I will keep it brief here. So the game's setting is a place called Mount Massive Asylum, an institute for the criminally insane located in the remote mountains of Lake County, Colorado. The asylum has a long history dating all the way back to the recruitment of Nazi scientists by the US back in 1945. But you needn't worry yourself about that today. The important thing is that in 2009, a company known as the Murkoff Corporation began conducting illegal experiments on the patients there. The after effects of these experiments, most notably exposure to something called the morphogenic engine created by Nazi scientist Dr. Rudolf Wernick, altered the minds of the patients and caused physical deformities. These special patients are known as variants due to the fact that the exact after effects of the experiments can't be determined. While they are all pretty much batshit crazy, some more so than others, there are other side effects that make some variants a bit more dangerous. Many of them seem to have increased physical strength and stamina, being able to easily smash doors and reinforce glass, as well as take abnormal amounts of physical damage. The ones with these capabilities tend to be the game's more notable antagonists. Which leads me finally to today's subject, the variant known as Eddie Gluskin. Eddie is a tall and fairly muscular middle-aged man. He's not like absolutely jacked or anything, but definitely large enough to overpower a good majority of the other inmates at Mount Massive. He's quite a bit taller than most people are aware of actually. The model comparison puts him around the same height as Chris Walker, at around 7 feet tall, give or take, which is ridiculous. He dresses quite fancy for an insane asylum inmate with a poorly sewn together suit vest, a filthy white dress shirt, black pants, black shoes fingerless gloves for some reason, and finally a dark blue bow tie to top it all off. His hair a black slicked back undercut. This is obviously not the standard attire you see on most of the inmates at Mount Massive, so we can only assume that Eddie crafted and stole this outfit from guards and other personnel that he likely murdered or found dead already, as well as with material he found in the vocational block. This is clearly in an effort to make himself appear more like a groom at a wedding, hence his nickname, The Groom. You'll learn the reason behind that shortly. Perhaps the most memorable feature about Eddie, however, is his face, covered in red scabs that are more prominent on the right side than the left. These are the result of exposure to the morphogenic engine, along with a terrible case of something called a subconjunctival hemorrhage in both of his eyes which is something that occurs when a tiny blood vessel breaks underneath the clear surface of the eye, which basically results in blood on the whites of your eyes. 
People get these all the time and they aren't usually harmful, but Eddie here clearly has a ridiculously extreme case, leaving the whites of his eyes almost completely red, which creates an interesting contrast with his blue eyes. Again, this is more prevalent on the right eye than the left, for whatever reason. So Eddie's background before being committed to Mount Massive is a bit hazy. In fact, there is only one document in the game that mentions it. A document called Project Wall Rider Patient Status Report of Eddie Gluskin. For your reference, Project Wall Rider is the name of the experiment taking place using the morphogenic engine. The goal being to get patients on the verge of madness to control the Wall Rider in a lucid dream state. The Wall Rider appears to be a supernatural being, but is really just a swarm of nanobots that collectively possess immense strength and seem to have a mind of their own. These experiments, as I said before, are the source of the increased insanity and strange reactions in patients at Mount Massive Asylum. But anyways, that's a topic for another video. From the report about Eddie Gluskin, we can learn a few things about him. Firstly, that his case number at Mount Massive is 196, and that the date of this consultation took place on June 9th, 2013. The note also says his initial consultation date was February 14th, 2013 which I believe is referring to his first consultation, so I'm assuming that might also be the date he was admitted to the asylum, but we can't be sure. He may have sat in a cell for a while before the consultation took place. Still though, this date is significant because February 14th is Valentine's Day, and Eddie Gluskin's entire theme is centered around love. It also states that he is a 46-year-old male and that his observing physician is one Dr. Garrett Snow. The fact that he's 46 on this report in 2013 means that he was born in 1966 or 1967, depending on whether he already had his birthday that year or if it was coming up. His therapy status is as follows. Lucid dreaming figures remain as murky as ever. Gluskin claims near constant control of his dream state, yet correspondence between his narrative and REM cycles. Highly arrhythmic REM slash NREM. Morphogenic engine activity plateaus at 90 ppm. So, as the researcher that I am, I tried to clarify exactly what it's talking about here. They are forcing Eddie into a lucid dream state as part of the therapy to control the wall rider. Eddie claims that he is in full control while in these states, but his REM is saying otherwise. REM, if you don't know, is rapid eye movement, which is a phase of sleep where our brain is most active and more likely to dream. The report then says that his rapid eye movement slash non-rapid eye movement is arrhythmic, meaning that it lacks rhythm or regularity. And lastly, that his morphogenic engine activity plateaus at 90 ppm. I had to look it up, but I guess ppm means parts per million and is a phrase in science used to express dilute concentration of substances. It's usually used to describe the concentration of something in water or soil. In the case of the morphogenic engine, I actually have no idea what it's referring to. But I do know that this report is basically saying that the therapy isn't going well, so 90 ppm must be too low, or maybe even too high. The next part of the report goes over Eddie's diagnostics. It says he has heavy bronchial accumulation, which seems to imply that some sort of material is building up in his airways, likely mucus. So Eddie likely has a bit of respiratory issues. It then says the rashes associated with hormone therapy have receded and vanished since we stopped using latex tubing. It seems Eddie might have a latex allergy. As for what the hormone therapy was for or what type of hormone therapy it was, I have no idea. There are many different types of hormone therapies, all of which have different goals, and we just don't have enough information on Eddie to determine what their goal was. I doubt they were trying to help him in any way, so I would probably rule out all of the hormone therapies that are used for treatment of medical conditions, such as cancer, sexual dysfunction, or hyperthyroidism. And I doubt they were trying to help him transition, so it likely wasn't a feminizing or masculinizing treatment. If I had to field a guess, I would say it's more likely to be some kind of chemical castration in order to reduce his sex drive or sexual fantasies slash capacity for arousal. These types of treatments are sometimes given to sex offenders to control sexual perversions, which is something you'll soon find out fits the bill with Eddie. So as I said, who exactly Eddie Gluskin was before the asylum is a bit vague, but these interview notes offer a glimpse. Gluskin remains a frustrating interview subject. 
He's trying to tell us what he thinks we want to hear while studiously avoiding certain elements of the truth. His childhood remains obvious fiction. He's claiming to have grown up in Leave It to Beaver, despite a traumatically violent ongoing sexual experience that is a matter of public and medical record. When I confronted him with the photographs his father and uncle took, he responded with a mixture of laughter and anger and restraints were issued. So it seems that as a child, Eddie was sexually abused by his father and his uncle and they took photographs of him. And Eddie is trying desperately to avoid talking about it or to repress the memory entirely. Either that or he is so delusional that he actually believes it never happened. This is a common theme we see with Eddie. He is constantly living in this fantasy world he creates inside of his head and never really acknowledges the reality of any situation. The interview notes then state, he similarly refuses to discuss his victims, both categorically and specifically. When I showed him pictures of the women, he would not admit that they were dead or mutilated. So this next part implies that Eddie is some sort of serial killer that would mutilate women and that once again, this is something he pretends or truly believes didn't happen. This is pretty much the extent of the backstory we have on Eddie Gluskin. He was sexually abused by his father and uncle, which seems to have led to him becoming a serial killer and then being admitted to Mount Massive Asylum after he was caught. The final paragraph of the report says that Eddie is claiming advancement in the morphogenic engine program that he has not yet achieved. He said that he could clearly hear the voice of the wall rider just by closing his eyes. Clearly he's trying to curry the favor of his doctors. I won't speculate what he expects to gain by it. So yeah, Eddie was lying during the experiment about making more progress than he actually was. I assume thinking in his delusion that maybe he would be released, rewarded, or that at the very least the experiments would stop. But what did Eddie do on the night of September 17th, 2013? The night of what's known as the Mount Massive Asylum Incident, during which both the original Outlast and Outlast Whistleblower take place. Let's go over it. In the game, you play as Murkoff employee Waylon Park. He's a software consultant who intends to expose the terrible things going on at Mount Massive Asylum. Waylon's journey at Mount Massive is very much entwined with Eddie. It begins on September 17th, 2013, two hours before the incident. Eddie Gluskin is being forced against his will into the morphogenic engine, while Waylon Park is working on one of the computers to debug something pertaining to the engine. Before they are able to restrain Eddie, he runs up to the glass and begs Waylon for help, exclaiming that Waylon has the power to stop this. Shortly after this, Waylon's laptop is found by Murkoff personnel, and he is exposed as the whistleblower. Murkoff's executive vice president of global development and head of Mount Massive Asylum, Jeremy Blair, then forcefully commits Waylon into the asylum as a patient to silence him. Later that same night, the Mount Massive Asylum incident occurs. To summarize, a wall rider candidate, Billy Hope, manages to control the wall rider and he wreaks havoc on the facility killing employees and patients alike. During the chaos, many of the variants escaped and they too began wreaking havoc in the asylum. The security forces and even private military were overwhelmed and slaughtered, and for one terrifying night, the inmates had full control of the entire facility, free to do whatever they pleased. Waylon, during his efforts to escape that night, would once again meet Eddie Gluskin, under entirely different circumstances. Eddie's domain that night became the asylum's vocational block. My assumption is that he was relocated to the hospital building after the morphogenic engine experiment due to the damages he suffered, and then made his way across to the vocational block when the incident occurred. Originally, I thought he would have been relocated back to his cell in the prison block, but Eddie actually has some sort of knockout gas when you meet him in the game, and the only place I can think that he would have gotten that is in the hospital. Anyways, the reason for going to the vocational block was likely due to the sewing machines and materials located here, as the vocational block is where the asylum would have provided training in practical skills during a patient's rehabilitation. Waylon's journey prior to reuniting with Eddie isn't really important for this video, but at some point in the night, Waylon fell through the roof of the vocational block into the attic. It's difficult in Outlast to really pinpoint what time it is when certain events take place, but I've done my research and given that the sun was already down in late September in Colorado, and the fact that there was still at the very least 13 or so hours left before Waylon's escape in the morning when the sun was rising, which 
would be around 6.45 to 7 a.m., could have been even 8 or 9, I would guess that Waylon enters the vocational block at about 7.30 to 8 p.m. Could even be a bit earlier. While in the attic of the asylum's vocational block, Waylon encounters a variant with a disassociative identity disorder named Dennis. Dennis and all of his personalities are absolutely terrified of Eddie, which is why he's hiding in the attic. Upon noticing that Waylon has intruded on his hiding place, Dennis decides that he will give Waylon to Gluskin as a sacrifice. He believes that in doing so, Eddie might leave him alone. There are quite a few lines from Dennis that heavily imply just how scared of Gluskin he is. I don't want to get Gluskin's attention. He'll hurt us. Walk softer. He can't know we're up here. I don't want to become... I've seen what he does. Quiet! If they, if they catch us, they'll give us to him. The man downstairs. Bad. Very bad. Very, very bad. God. Oh God. So I wanted to bring this up because it implies that Eddie Gluskin has really made a name for himself amongst the other inmates that night. The groom, the thing below, the man downstairs, Eddie Gluskin seems to have this reputation, at least in the vocational block, of this terrifying monster. The reason I brought up the time Waylon likely fell into the attic is because it means that Eddie somehow built up this reputation and became known as the groom, and it was only probably like 8pm or earlier. Which means he had clearly been putting in the work from the minute the incident occurred. When we go over the kill count, you'll see just how much work he put in. To further that, there's also a note that can be found just outside of the vocational block in the drying ground that has a poem written over and over again on it that reads, Above the knees, below the navel, sliced and sewn on Gluskin's table. To make a place to push inside, the groom will make himself a bride. So yeah, gross, but it seems that there are more inmates besides Dennis who are aware of Eddie and the things he is doing inside the vocational block. Anyways, Waylon escapes Dennis and makes his way downstairs to the third floor of the vocational block. When leaving the attic, you can hear Dennis say, Give him other flesh, and he spares ours. Fucking idiot. He delivered his own self to Gluskin's hail. On the third floor of the vocational block, we can see many sewing machines and materials lying around. This is obviously where Eddie created his groom outfit. But sewing clothes was, unfortunately, not the only thing Eddie was doing here. Eddie, as I mentioned, was looking for his perfect bride. There are no women in the asylum at this point, so Eddie had to get, uh, creative. I'll be blunt and brief about this. Eddie is mutilating the male inmates to make them look more feminine using a table saw, a knife, and the sewing equipment. If they don't die from the mutilation, Eddie ends up killing them anyways when he finds them unfit to be his bride. You see, he's obsessed with the idea of a perfect bride. He takes a male inmate and attempts to create a woman by removing the male genitalia, shaving off excess body hair, and cutting open and stuffing the chest area to create breasts. At his workshop, you can even find a diagram of the male reproductive system as if he was trying to figure out what he needed to remove or where he needed to cut. Yeah, it's disgusting and I'm gonna have to blur most of it for YouTube. When any of the inmates reject Eddie by trying to escape or fight back against him, his usual charming personality will quickly fade and he becomes very insulting, misogynistic, and extremely violent, resulting in that inmate's death. Throughout the vocational block, we can find drawn up plans for wedding dresses, one in particular that has an X over the crotch area, as well as actual dresses that were either made when the asylum was still functioning normally or made by Eddie that night. There is also a wedding area that Eddie set up, complete with an aisle to walk down, chairs for guests, a body strung up in a wedding dress, and a picture of a man on a cross, I suppose to be the priest. He also, aside from marrying the perfect bride, is obsessed with having children. Part of his efforts to create a woman is so that he can have someone to be the mother of his children. Obviously this isn't possible, but as I said, Eddie lives within his own twisted fantasy and refuses to acknowledge reality at all. He seems to truly believe that the male inmates are women and that he can get them pregnant. The reasons for Eddie seeking out a perfect wife and children can be somewhat uncovered by clues around the vocational block and listening to Eddie's dialogue. 
One thing I found was a message on the wall written by Eddie that says, Love makes a house a home. This tells me that Eddie wants to be the father he never had and have a happy, love-filled home because he grew up with quite the opposite. I believe that because of his trauma, Eddie is obsessed with having the perfect family, which goes back to his comments about living in a leave it to beaver home. So first, he needs to find the perfect wife to have children with because, as the wall says, love makes a house a home. His dialogue sheds even more light on things. I know you're lonely like I am. Don't you want love, a family, someone to take care of you? So he's lonely and again he wants what he never had, a loving family. But perhaps a more straightforward quote, I want a family, a legacy, to be the father I never had. I'll never let anything happen to our children. Not like so this is the most clear motivation that Eddie gives us. Just like I said, he wants to be the father he never had. He wants to protect his children and never let anything happen to them like what happened to him. That's probably the closest we'll get to an explanation for Eddie's horrendous actions. It's not directly stated anywhere in the game, but I would say that it's likely that Eddie's mom left them when he was a kid, and so he has some sort of abandonment issues because of that, and maybe blames his mother for what happened to him because she left him with his father and uncle. That would explain why Eddie gets so angry when he's rejected or when his bride candidates try to escape and leave him. It would also explain his hatred towards women and why he is so set on finding the perfect wife. Because he wants one that won't leave like his mother did. That's all just conjecture though, it's not fact. It's interesting actually because there is a note from Waylon called Bluebeard's Wives, and one thing he says in it is, whatever story he's telling himself, he's not making women to bear his children, he's making women to kill them. Which could imply that it's all just a coping mechanism or an excuse he's giving himself to kill women and that deep down he doesn't actually care about having a perfect bride or children. Anyways, let's wrap this up. So Waylon enters the third floor vocational block where he ends up running into Eddie who takes an immediate liking to Waylon. A line from Eddie that says, We've met before, haven't we? I know I've seen your face. Implies that Eddie remembers Waylon from the underground lab earlier that night. Eddie relentlessly pursues Waylon and he ends up jumping down an elevator shaft to escape, injuring his leg in the process. Now on the second floor of the vocational block and still being pursued by Eddie, Waylon hides in a locker but Eddie finds him and drags the entire locker, Waylon and all, into another room that he is using as his workshop. As I said, Eddie is quite strong. I suppose now would be a good time to mention that if you are caught by Eddie, the player death animation is him picking you up by the neck off the ground with one arm and stabbing you with the other. So yeah, that's how strong he is. Eddie then gasses Waylon while still in the locker with some sort of knockout gas. And as the game states, Waylon is knocked out for a whole 12 hours. That's pretty much the whole night. And he would be waking up not too far from sunrise. When he wakes up, he witnesses Gluskin mutilating some people on his table before passing out again and waking up on the table himself, completely naked with a table saw between his legs. Just before Eddie's saw reaches Waylon, however, a variant jumps out and attacks Eddie, giving Waylon enough of a distraction to escape out of a broken window, breaking his leg from the fall. Unfortunately, Waylon needs to go back into the first floor of the vocational block to find the key to unlock the mail ward. Eddie continues to pursue Waylon and captures him once again, this time deciding to hang Waylon in the gymnasium where he keeps all of his other failed brides. During the struggle, however, Eddie's pulley system breaks from the weight and causes Eddie to get caught up in the ropes, pulled upward, and impaled on a metal bar. As he dies, he grabs Waylon's hand and says his most popular line. We could have been beautiful. Waylon then falls, causing the bar to push farther through Eddie's body, killing him. And that was the end of Eddie Gluskin. Dead in Mount Massive Asylum's gymnasium on the morning of September 18th, 2013, after killing a considerable number of his fellow inmates as part of his twisted fantasies. But just how many people did Eddie Gluskin kill that night? Well, as the absolute maniac that I am, I went into the game and explored the entirety of the vocational block and counted all of Eddie's bodies while trying not to become one myself. First, there are the women he killed before being admitted to Mount Massive. We don't know how many women this was, but it is women plural, so 
there's at least two, and two seems like a small number for Eddie, so I'd say that there's likely more. I'm going to be conservative and say at least three, although I think it's probably more. Three plus. I also doubt that when the Mount Massive incident took place, Eddie made it all the way from the hospital or the prison to the vocational block without killing at least one employee or patient on his way. Obviously this number can't be known, so I will again be conservative and just add one to the count. Okay, so this is where things get crazy. In the vocational block, the first group of Eddie's bodies we find is a disgusting creation of him with bodies made to look like a childbirth scene. I can't show this on YouTube, but it's difficult to tell just how many bodies are here, so I counted heads. There's two full bodies with heads, a head in the crotch area made to look like the baby coming out, and also we can see a head peeking out of the stomach that Eddie stuffed with body parts to make it look pregnant. So there's at least four bodies here. Next, I found another head on a mannequin. After Waylon is knocked out, he witnesses Eddie kill at least two inmates from the slits in the locker. When Eddie is attacked by a variant, he chases him off somewhere, and um, I'm going to assume he killed him. I walked around Eddie's workshop and counted all the bodies in there. Or rather, I counted torsos because there were body parts everywhere and it's hard to tell what belongs to who, so I decided the torsos made the most sense to count. There were a total of 11 bodies in the workshop, minus two because we already counted two of them from the cutscene, so nine. I found a body in one of the vents that seems to be an employee, but it's hard to tell if Eddie killed this guy because he is in the vents and it doesn't really fit Eddie's MO because if he caught this guy, he would have probably brought him back to make him his wife. Also, Eddie is pretty big as I mentioned, so I don't know if he can actually fit in the vents, so I'm not gonna count this guy. In Eddie's wedding area, there is one body strung up as the bride. Okay, now for the ridiculous part. In the gymnasium where Eddie strings up all of his failed brides, there is a considerable number of bodies. Counting torsos again, there are five bodies on the floor. There are so many bodies hanging from the ceiling, however, that it's nearly impossible to count with the game's camera. It's just too difficult to keep track of which ones you already counted or not. I can tell you that there are 55 ropes going up to the ceiling, which are meant to be what each body is tied to, so there are at least 55 bodies. However, walking around I noticed that some bodies are not attached to these ropes, and so I tried to count just those ones, and I kept getting around 14 to 15. So in total, this gymnasium has about 70 bodies hanging from the roof, give or take. That's right, Eddie Gluskin has a kill count of at the very least 97. But I can say pretty much with certainty that it's probably more than 97. But what's really insane is that all of these kills outside of the women he killed before being admitted happened all in one night. Eddie Gluskin killed and mutilated close to 100 people in one night. In one night. He might actually be the most prolific murderer in the entire asylum, although Chris Walker might be a strong contender. Anyways, that's going to be all. You now know just about everything there is to know about Outlast's Eddie Gluskin. Let me know in the comments down below what character you'd like me to do next. Leave a like if you guys enjoyed the video, and I will see you guys next time.